Sunshine on downtown east side sidewalks glows fresh crimson like rose petals fallen from ransacked gardens of the brokenhearted. From those who wear the violent evenings on faces bruised black and purple, whose teeth are kicked through panicked mouths begging mercy, whose sight is slashed blind by knives of darkness inside murdered souls, whose lives are worn out demolitions and screaming alleys of vomit and unending misfortunes, and for those crawling drunk and sick into jaws of rabid doorways and handcuffs of the police, and for those who fall or get pushed or raving leap from caged-in hotel windows of desperation and hate and grief, and for those lining up more patient than saints in cold rain and seagull shit to receive crusts of bread, and for those sniffing glue beside railroad tracks of uselessness to derail a birthplace renovated into exile, and for those whose scared runaway skin is sold without hope to hypocrisy's ghosts, and for those cheated by political schemes and are drowned in tidal waves of unknown committees, and for refugees pouring in from the Earth's economic wars, and for refugees fleeing wars in the roots of their hair, and for those straight jacketed into numbers and things whose withered spirits don't interest the scientific God who has forsaken them. And for those run over by monstrous rush hours of skyscrapers and mountains of enormous wealth, and you'll get busted for jaywalking, a puddle of small debt. And for those whose lungs are wrecked in a quicksand of malnourished, infested to murky red. many years of my life I've been a, a drug addict and an alcoholic and lived on the streets and grew up uh, in areas similar, low-income areas, uh, areas called Skid Row in, uh, in Toledo, Ohio. And spent a lot of time in, in New York City and in Toronto before coming to Vancouver almost 11 years ago and coming to the downtown east side. And for the first several years here, I was uh, one of the drug addicts on the 100 block of Hastings and uh, on the corner of, uh, in front of the Carnegie Center. And um, so then when I became sober and straight a few years ago, I thought, well, I was uh, in pretty bad shape and I was really grateful to have another chance to live. Where I come from, a place of death, and hopelessness and total despair for all of my life. And I started trying to kill myself first before I was five, and the last time I drove a car into a wall at 70 miles an hour, I was 35. And uh, so well, I had no life, I had no hope, I had nothing, and did everything I could to end my life and, and destroy it. And yet, uh, here I am, much more alive than I ever thought I would be. I'd say that mostly my life until recent years has been more about death than life. Um, my father hanged himself in jail when I was very young, and my mother was an alcoholic, an addict, and mentally ill, and pretty much self-destructed. And uh, my aunt shot my grandmother and then shot herself. My stepfather's a murderer and a rapist, and he's in prison. And so where I came from was kind of when people said, I talked about being alive, and I really honestly didn't know what they meant until again in the last uh, several years and I certainly felt my life was impossible and uh, but things changed remarkably and I that's my hope in the downtown east side and it looks like an impossible situation for human beings everywhere they're faced with big odds that something new can happen in their lives and uh, something has in mind and so I never thought that I would uh, write a poem with the title of this first one we're going to do, uh, which is autobiographical, coming from places that I did, and it's called uh, Amazingly Alive. 
Here I am, amazingly alive, tried to kill myself twice by the time I was five. Sometimes it's hard to take one more breath inside this North American culture of death. Big, big trouble from the time I was born. Lots of people get stripped right to the bone, say nobody's gonna touch me anymore. If I'm gonna live, gonna be a cutthroat whore. Can't touch my heart, can't touch my soul. Yeah, I know all about this North American culture of horror, but here we are, amazingly alive, against long odds, left for dead. Lazarus couldn't have been more shocked than me to have been brought back from the dead. A judge told me I was of no use, no use at all to society. But I got news, news for him. A society of bullshit, bullshit and greed. Ain't no damn use, ain't no use to me. A hot shot head shrink at a locked up nut house told me I was so totally hopeless, so far out and so fucked up, nothing could ever wake my life up. But I got news for him today. Right now I'm so amazingly alive, I'm dancing, dancing on my own grave. What is different now than ever before in my life is that I do have a a community of people who care around me. And that has made all the difference. At times when I would start to sink into such a place and withdraw into more self-destructive thoughts or things, there are people around me who, who care what's going on with me and what's happening. I decided that I would make a commitment here, so I thought, well, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll commit my life then now to trying to raise a defense uh, against uh, gentrification. To me, the political work that I do here is an extension of the vocation of being a poet. Um, it, it, it could be enough to write poems and speak the poems and say the things, and I, that's the deepest thing in my heart. A, a primary legacy from my father were his books, which my mother for years carried around with us. We lived in numerous places, and, and, but there were a couple of hundred or more books of his. And there was poetry and uh, philosophy and novels and plays. and. Uh, I wanted to read those uh, to find out more about him. For me, with poetry, it begins with uh, the Hebrew prophets in the uh, Old Testament. They were poets, and they spoke against injustice and oppression and uh, denounced it, no matter what the cost was to them, uh, personally. And they spoke for community, which is how a poet should be, which is how those uh, ancient prophets certainly were well aware they were part of a community, and yet their poems uh, spoke to me more deeply and seemed to understand me better than anyone around me, anyone I'd ever known. They seemed to know what I was feeling, they'd gone through similar things, and uh, it really helped me a lot. It helped me uh, get through another day, it helped carry me even longer than that sometimes. I, at that time, thought, well, this, this is what I wanted to do with my life and is to give it to writing a poem one day that would do for someone else, someone that I didn't know, the same thing that, that those poems were doing for me. When I go and make speeches of things about the downtown east side, to me they're poems, I write them as poems. Of a thousand dreams, of a thousand hopes, of a thousand yearnings for real community, lost to us but memorialized today, brought finally into a unity here in this community park, this park which is the geographical heart of the downtown east side. be able to be as a poet in this community and to be have people here that I know ask me to write and read a poem for an occasion is extraordinary it's just so I don't I don't hear that too much and it's such a that means more to me than um, I don't know 
whatever else could come from just writing poetry and trying to get published in literary magazines nobody reads anyway or trying to hustle literary awards or hustle the literary scene. I mean, all that sort of thing. This is such a rare and unique thing. It's such a tremendous gift. for one another, care for those least able to care for themselves, care for all, care in action. And there is no one to care if you do not care. There is no one, no one at all to care if I do not care. Actually, my efforts began around the Woodward's building, which over there, the big W, I thought that was the most significant building in the downtown east side. It was empty. And I felt that that building, if it went for the needs of the people who are poor here and, uh, and most afflicted and vulnerable in terms of providing uh, services, daycare, detox, whatever, that building is so huge and vast inside. Plus, there could have been 400 uh, large suites of housing for uh, people on welfare. and. Uh, that it would have anchored the community against gentrification. It would have sent a really strong message if that whole building had gone for the needs. Political Response Group is an independent group, meaning it doesn't, it neither seeks nor has any funding from any governmental source or governmental agency. We made that a principle because we didn't want to, depending on the avenues our activities took and our political actions, that. Uh, wouldn't be influenced by the threat of a loss of funding. People who live down here see people who are, who are also from down here who are uh, making a stand on their behalf. I think the interaction with the other people in the community is what um, is, is uh, most important to us and PRG about those demonstrations here. Then we have to challenge them, we have to figure out the way we're going to articulate that challenge in a way that's solidarity building and not alienating. Right. Where's our line of saying, this is what we want, and we won't stop until we get something that looks something like this? Basically, first of all, is there anyone willing that wants to do anything today? Mm -hmm. Spray paint on those things with the initials PRG on there. There it is. like to see this uh, built in a way that actually is sensitive to and caring for the needs of this community, not, you know, upscale market. So we're spray painting. Welfare people, you know what they are doing, what they do. Government pay the rent for them and the rest of money they buy drugs. No, that's not true. There are yeah, that, lots that's of true. No, it is not. That's a total lie in this neighborhood. That is a typical image of this neighborhood. This neighborhood is full of people who are on handicapped pensions. This neighborhood is full of old folks. This neighborhood is full of single moms with children. Those people need housing as well, too. This neighborhood is full of people who have needs, real needs. To the Asians. I'm disappointed. Extremely the other people who live in this neighborhood. Uh, if they open this building, it's good for the government, or for everyone. 400 condos. What kind of a response is that to the people who live in this neighborhood? And when they're going to turn this all into upscale housing, we have a responsibility to respond, especially as a community, because I live in this neighborhood. And when I see them just gentrifying this neighborhood, and I wouldn't mind it if they were building housing somewhere for these people, but they don't. The government, they don't care about the poor people. And that's what we're saying, you should care about the poor people. Uh, you're out here on the street or you're, or you're under the viaduct or you're somewhere else running around down here I'd say it's pretty or you're, or you're about ready to kill yourself because you got shitty housing and, and uh, no money I'd say it's about as bad as it can get What's that? That's it? Oh
Well, what happened here was a demonstration to try and prevent the city from putting this housing back onto the market and to try and make sure that by being kept off the market, local people living here have a chance at getting the housing that they desperately need. It's the same situation here as in the Lower East Side of New York or, in all the, or around the world. It's poor people being driven out of their land and especially ones at the bottom are being targeted and nobody's going to want to do anything in an important way about it. This building is a classic example of the market working at its best. This is what the market does. It disinvests and ruins buildings so that there's a chance and an opportunity for profitable reinvestment another time. The landlords get two cracks at it. They build the building and make the profit that way. They make the profit as the building declines because they're not paying for the maintenance and repairs. And then they want another crack at it when the building is redeveloped. Olaf Solheim had lived in the hotel for 62 years. This was his home. This is the only place that he knew. They had rewarded him by giving him an eviction notice after 60 years. And within three weeks of leaving the Patricia Hotel, he had starved himself to death and had died. The news of the, the death uh, went around the world. Uh, the Norwegian papers from where he was from couldn't believe that we would treat the uh, elderly in Canada in such a way as to evict them with no place to go out of their home so that someone could make a few bucks off the expo, off this World's Fair. Well, this is just one story of a whole number of hotels. And, and the, uh, the thing is, it fractured the community in an incredible way because many of the people that were evicted went spent years trying to deal with it because they had a social network it was made up of friends, it was made up of corner stores, it was made up of the local doctor, it was made up of everything within a short walking distance, and that was completely destroyed. And for what? And yet we're going through the same thing again, where the dollar signs become more important than, uh, you know, uh, housing for people. Why well, move somewhere else? Look at the expense they're going to go through. Cut the TV off and uh, this and that, and then they got to do my checks and everything. Too much, too much trouble. There are some, some older guys who have been in these hotels for 40 and 50 and 60 years. Um, so yeah, where are they going to move on to? They're going to go home to what? I mean, where else in Canada are you going to find housing that you can afford to live in like that? You know, uh, possibly a couple of spots in the prairies, but that'll fill up quickly. And how are they going to locate there when, they, when, when they're getting $175 a month to live on? No matter how pure a soap claims to be, it will dry out your skin. If I'm one of the fortunate to get in to Woodward's, I will have my own bedroom, my own bathroom, my own kitchenette, living room, and they say they're hoping and praying, sort of a little bit of a balcony. Now, that's the difference between heaven and hell. This is hell, there is heaven. I'll be there at nine so I got a big fan. Fan out in all the rooms and deliver pamphlets to who's ever there and put them on whatever desks are there. This is the door in. There's a desk right here. It's small. It's not allowed to couches or a chair here. Uh, and right across there's a small office here, there's a small office here, and the one at the end is, is his office. I'm especially concerned about taking this to his office because um, it's a very personal confrontation. It's going to take us personally as if we went into his bed in the middle of the night and kicked him in the head. At least my feeling is that it has to be done very carefully with respect to this person. The battle for Woodward's is a battle for the downtown east side. The symbolic and peaceful occupation of FAMA Holding Limited is being held to protest FAMA's violent occupation of the downtown east side of Vancouver. Yeah. FAMA's decision to betray its commitment to social housing at the Woodward's building and plan instead 364 condominiums is a death blow to the unique, creative, and valuable community of economically poor people in the downtown east side. This was somewhat disruptive to his business. Well, this is very mildly disruptive. 
uh, compared to the disruption in people's lives that this project will engender as we, if it goes through. The fate of the downtown east side really hinges on what happens at Woodward's. The people who are going to lose, the people who are going to be cost from this, are the people who live down there. The people who are in the SRO hotels that are deteriorating, those are the people who are losing. It's a very disrespectful and dishonorable, this decision that has been made. Whoever is responsible for it, ultimately, the loser of the whole thing are the people who are going to be housed in there. We want Woodward now! We want Woodward now! We want Woodward now! serving the needs of the people who live in this part of town and it's going to generate its own momentum of change in that part of the city which is going to basically turn it into an extension of the downtown core uh, rather than trying to develop a unique flavor in this neighborhood and, and creating something that is not the downtown core, is not business oriented, is not upscale market oriented. For years and years and years we had fought to close down and, and board up a lot of these hotels because they just weren't fit for human habitation. That hasn't changed much in the interim years. What has changed is the desperation that people have in their housing needs and we can't afford to lose even that crappy housing. Since 1976. I was gone for 15 years when I called my grandma. She said, Oh, we thought you were dead. It's been such a goal for me to become manageable and have this, you know, this, this drugs that I like so much. It, it costs a lot. It costs for my family, it costs for my wife and my children. Um, a lot of freedom. And they think we make big bucks because we're doing drugs and we're prostituting. We're barely keeping alive. I did too much uh, heroin and I was back there with a friend. And apparently I'd done not even half of it and I dropped. I was dead right up until the time the ambulance got there. He gave me about five shots in our time, brought me back. You stand on this side of a junkie and say he deserves something and uh, then you First you take on the police, then you take on the city, then you take on the problem, then you have to take on the federal government, then you take on the international uh, money that's displacing people and building corporate interests. You take on the whole thing to address one serious social problem. They're all so interrelated now. Look at methadone people. People go on methadone. They learn to, to their life becomes manageable all of a sudden, but yet they're still doing a drug. They're why? Well, then how come I can't do my John Belushi's, which is like up and down together, you know, and smoke rock and still maintain a manageable life? Change the criminal code so physicians and doctors can prescribe and administer heroin and cocaine. And then it's going to be uh, health care, treatment centers, halfway houses, detoxes. Uh, outreach street workers, a real serious commitment to dealing with an extraordinary, serious and widespread social problem. Society has to have someone to blame and society is blaming the drug users right now and the drug addicts. 
And the people are afraid of this situation. They don't want to get to know the drug addicts. They don't want to get involved in the mess that it is. But this is the real mess. You don't get involved in that mess of the bad poor, then you're not involved, as far as I'm concerned, in trying to do anything really productive or constructive or in defense of this community. Right now I'm living at the Belmora Hotel. And the cops down here are trying to throw us out, you know, because uh, we're addicts and we've all got problems. So they're trying to basically kick us off the street. And uh, basically, we've all got places that we can't go anymore, you know? That's low-income housing across the street. You think they're going to take our application and let us in there? No way. Not all of us are pigs and live like pigs. Just because we use doesn't mean we're pigs and we live That's like right. pigs. So why are they building this if they're not going to let us move in there? That's what low housing is all about. People at this restaurant over here that I eat at, I got to pay my bill before my feet even gets there. But other people can pay it when they walk out the door. Yeah. If you turf the people out, they're not going to move into another neighborhood. What other neighborhoods are going to take them? Where are they going to move from here? So they're going to be living in this neighborhood. Whether they live in the hotels or they live on the streets, they're going to be living here. We sleep here uh, every oh, night, eh? Wet, wet, raining, and, uh, you know, like, we take turns fighting over them over a little sleeping spot. I sleep under a bridge because I don't want to stand on the corner anymore. I'm tired of standing on the corner. I live in the Bill Morrow, and it's like uh, the hell resort. We have to survive down here. And what happens? These big, big, fancy people come in here and they take over. What do you mean there's no kind of housing? They had that Woodward there. They're trying to, trying to start something there, and nothing's happening yet with it, eh? Like, I used to live in the Roosevelt, and the Roosevelt was closed down. Well, I had a room there where I had to have a bucket underneath my sink every time I turned on the water. There was no pipe underneath the sink. You know? Getting a room around here is like us. It's like, uh, might as well live outside. Yeah. Eh? Like the poor guy don't have a chance down here. Basically, it's a flush, flushing system. Eventually, you're going to break down here, and when you do, you're like everybody else down here. You know, hey, you want up, you want down, you want clothes up, you want whatever. You know. I don't have a home. I'm on the street. I'm, I'm staying in a shelter. I'm looking for a home. Where am I going to be? Like, uh, nah. we get kicked out of parts, but we still come back, eh? We keep each other warm because we're all fun. I run out of blankets. I hear you. Our place now is becoming a common uh, dope dealing house, a complex. In and out 24 hours a day, dope dealers, dope addicts. Junkies screaming everywhere. You got people going crazy all hours of the nights. The cops are in there. And there's no city inspectors in there. Uh, you know, the place is just a disease. Little tiny people are being pushed out on the street. And the big high class people are coming in here and taking over everything. I wouldn't live down here with my kids. I seen things down here with parents with their kids down here scoring dope. Now it's not a kid's lifestyle to be down here. A lot of, a lot of brothers and sisters died over this. Yes. You know, it's so cheap. It's only too I see it as like we're all society's outcasts. Well, society's outcasts because we're, they're pushing us in that direction. And they complain about us, but they don't want to do nothing to help us. I stayed clean for nine years, clean and sober and straight. Couldn't get anywhere. So come back down here and do I'm doing the same stuff again. That's the only way you can make your life is down here on this kid. I almost contacted every two mainly uh, deadly diseases down here. And I'm dying very, very quickly. They've given me about maybe six more months to live because of uh, being HIV positive for nine years to have super salad. This is where I'm gonna die. I'm, I'm, I've got a disease right now. I don't have much longer to go. My husband's gone, my kids are gone. I have nothing. Just one of these stupid fucking little rooms. This is the most dramatic and crying need right now, is a place for the people who are uh, both infected with HIV and are in uh, danger of being infected. If they had homes to go to, um, they wouldn't be in the vulnerable conditions and have to use the utterly unhealthy and wretched conditions to use the drugs that they have to now because they don't have adequate housing. And so housing then has to be a part of this. The sad part is the short-sightedness of governments. If they were to, uh, to step in and do something about it and spend the money to develop decent housing, it would save 
so much money in the long term in policing costs and healthcare costs, social work costs, etc., all the way down the line. I mean, how can you expect a, a, a single mother to raise her kid in these hotels right now? The need that down here, which is so grave, has never been addressed. It's sort of we can fight and struggle to get a few units of replacement housing, but the need increases and the need is, is uh, uh, more on a, on a crisis level than ever. Right now, what this community needs and the people who are committed to it is to uh, outline a map to get us from the point where we're under siege and being uh, displaced and the community is being destroyed, uh, literally, to a place where it can be defended and sustained. When a condominium project goes up, like the Van Horn, people have said, and even from down here, well, it was just a parking lot before. So now there's condos there. How can you object? Well, uh, because that space that that parking lot in is, it was going to be turned into housing, should have been turned into housing for the people that are already homeless, the increasing numbers of people sleeping in Oppenheimer Park and in doorways, and then the viaduct around here. Uh, so it displaces space for them. This being a land issue, that is land now, the Van Horn taking it up, that cannot be used for the needs of the people down here. So to me, that's a displacement. Yeah, I, I know that there's been a huge political um, uproar about the Van Horn itself uh, and its proximity to this area. I know that they want to, or they are pushing for more social housing down here, but I think in order for the community to grow, I, I myself am not out to push these people out of the area because I think it's just pushing the problem to another part of town. It's not getting rid of the problem. And I think in order to create a better community, you've got to have a mix of social housing and market housing. And what people said they wanted were mixed communities. They wanted to see people on low incomes living side by side with families living side by side with people in higher incomes, all mixed into a community. Well, unfortunately, development pressure doesn't allow that. What development puts in is the very high end of the scale. The government tries to fill in the gap by putting in something at the very low end of the scale, and you have this gigantic area in the middle. And what you're gonna see is incredibly polarized communities. I don't wanna see this neighborhood develop that. For this, for this, building to go up was strange, I'll admit. It, it was a strange location. It, it was a, an odd choice to put a building in this, in this neighborhood. But I felt that in order for me to be a part of the betterment of this community, I wanted to be a part of, of the new downtown east side where everyone was welcome. What usually happens or the typical pattern is that poor artists move into a low-income area. And as coffee houses and art galleries begin to appear, tourists begin to come attracted by the artistic activity. And forums from that then develops the phenomenon like Gastown. The restaurants, the cafes, the sort of quality of life for the poor people uh, will vanish and will be replaced by what people with uh, higher incomes will want. I think the huge problem um, down here isn't so much the drug addicts or the bums that are down here. It's, it's a horrible situation for them, but it's the yahoos who come down and party all night and have clashes with these people and abuse them and the yelling and screaming that goes on. The noise emanating from these places is just astounding and lineups and people who don't care that there's an apartment right above them while they're standing in line with a hundred other people to get into this place. On a Friday or Saturday night when this is going on, we might see one or two of these cars a night. And I really think that if they really want to control that down here, that they've got to have more police presence. They have to have more people walking the streets. If you told me four years ago that there was going to be artisan law studios for white collar homeowners down here across from Pigeon Park, I probably would have still been laughing. I never ever expected that development to occur so quickly. For a lot of these people, I'm sure that they had bought the place based on looking at a display suite in an afternoon. Bright uh, sunny day. Down in Gastown. Literally, it's almost an invasion. And this is the, the you kind of see the force there and they're keeping out all the undesirables and uh, that'll slowly expand and encompass this area and maybe eventually take over the, the Pigeon Park. A lot of the hotel owners in the quote-unquote Skid Row area 
are uh, hanging on to their properties. They're not running their properties with any philanthropic uh, intentions or providing good, clean, healthy shelter. They're hanging on, they're loading their places uh, for uh, welfare money and uh, their bare minimum standards, their uh, health traps uh, for all kinds of problems and they don't care because they know at some point in time their double wide lot is worth X amount of dollars. Traditionally, and years ago, it would have been a real nice hotel. And uh, you can see what it's become as soon as we uh, we get up inside the hotel. The marble steps, the uh, wood railing, the crown moldings, marble inlay, uh, big marble baseboards. The it's common been, wiring, you know, as you can see, it's, it's, been, been, it's been updated. This is a typical room uh, in a rundown rooming house. You've got uh, garbage everywhere. You've got a human excrement over there. We had a mouse just shoot under our feet here. You've got cockroaches all over uh, the room. And uh, it's it can be inhabited, these rooms. I've seen up to five, six, eight people um, flop in one of these rooms and actually living out of them. Hello, city police. Hi, how are you doing? This is, um, this is typical, look at the sink. Got overflowing, running onto the floor. Are these wrappings here are all in here of drug use? These are the packages no, that deals come in. Now you see, even the guy who's innocuous, he's sleeping. Even close to him, he's got this blade here. Well, just in case, uh, someone else he didn't like woke him up, he'd uh, start slashing and bashing. Guys, right, shoes? Where are your shoes? No shoes. No shoes? Okay, well, get You're registered to the room, right? Yeah. This is uh, the guy registered to the room here. Yeah. Um, how long? You can call him in here if you want. How long have you been in here? 25 years. 25 good years. No, not 25 good years. No, a couple bad years thrown in. Yeah. Are you planning on staying here? No, no. Where do you want to go? Any place but here. If you had your choice, where would you go? If you could go anywhere. Uh, probably commercial. Commercial drive. Well, what kind of people cause you trouble down here? Cause you problems? Well, it's tweakers. Um, you know what, what, what do you mean by a tweaker? Dope addicts. You know, they smoke coke all the time, man. They kick my door in. They had all my... Everything they stole, everything off me. There are some people down here that own hotels that provide decent, clean housing for low-income people. Uh, and they're doing a good job of it, but uh, there are some that uh, you can see the writing clearly on the wall, what they're intending to do. That's a good room there. Tenant is, uh, you know, lazy, they mess. But when they move out, boxing myself, painting myself, turning like this. A single room, 325, double room, 350. But I can't charge more because the people, they're under the, under the low income. Even a bad people, you give them, a, you know, treat them good, they becoming good. Same thing, you give them good place to live, then they, they behave themselves. Why isn't something being done? Uh, why can't the police solve this? And when you look at, uh, at the police and what we really can do and what we can't do, you realize that most of what goes down here is comes under the rubric of can do. Like a road map of your life. Yeah, we got a cover up based on the north, uh, north chapter here. God forgives, I don't. The what? God forgives, oh. I don't. <laughs> part of motorcycle gangs. Okay. And when you do them, you got an executioner with skulls in them here. 
every every person you do, you had a skull. Red eyes are females and black are males. It's never quiet. It's never, you know, it's an area where if you want to get off the dope, it's not the perfect place to be, you know. They just want your rent check and the rest, man, you know. It doesn't matter about fixing the place or cleaning up or painting. They just don't care, you know. The place is too small. I can't, and I start cooking what, you know. I can't do it. It's impossible. So I got to eat at the restaurant all the time. And sometimes I don't always have the money to eat at the restaurant, so what do I do? You know what I do? I do have to do crime. What's happening is uh, we're arresting a rock factory in your hallway about two and a half feet from the business office. Call Fred Flintstone. You got any more on you? Hey, partner. Okay. Would you actually admit it? Yep. Carry on. Fuck off. Watch your language, ma'am. It's not Robson Street. I'm having... I'm out. That's all you got? You got, you got two pieces of rock, a couple of flaps. What was that, cocaine or heroin? What's her name is Sierra Mike Oscar Kilo. Oh, yeah. The one is Cal. Narcotics in possession is a standard charge for having personal use coke or heroin or marijuana. And uh, uh, we aren't getting any sentences for it. So we have to be realistic. Do you want to tie two guys up on uh, uh, drug possession use when the parliament is uh, leaning towards a social issue? Uh, the courts are leaning towards it being a social issue, uh, drug use. 150 more policemen will not do it, because if you're an addict and you need the drugs, it doesn't matter how many cops there are. It makes no difference at all. And if you're desperate enough to the point that I reached when I was using, I was ready on the verge of going out with a hammer. I mean, my habit was so high, and I had been arrested for shoplifting so often at that point that I thought, this is it, I gotta do something more direct to get the money than just uh, go steal something, try to sell that, then go get the drugs, then go through this whole thing. I was just gonna go out at night on the street with a hammer. I had the hammer. I was just gonna whack people on the head. The more vulnerable looking person, the better. The more weaker looking person, as long as they looked like they had a couple of bucks, I was gonna whack them and take their money. And I thought, the thought came to me, well, you know, you could kill somebody or maim them. And I thought, that's too bad. I have to have the money. There's no other way. There's no other way. been sexually, physically, or mentally abused, somehow, some way, either if not by our family, by the system, by a stranger. If, may, if maybe people would take the time to really look at us and see the person we are instead of judging a book before they read the cover, they'd see that there are a lot of people crying for help out here. Homeless people, panhandlers, prostitutes, and drug addicts on the street, all those people are bad and they're not part of anybody's community. And so we can do whatever we want with them. 
And sure, there's an attitude of that down here the same way. It's the same attitude when people here in the agency say, we don't want this to be a dumping ground. This isn't a dumping ground. It's the capacity of a real community to care for those who are disabled, for those who are ill, for those who are really troubled. And this system is producing more and more people who are, uh, who will never, there's never going to be a job for them. So the cheapest thing is to just demonize them and uh, consider them not part of our community and then get rid of them and to do it with a good conscience because look at all the problems they're causing. They're breaking into our cars, they're, they're uh, eyesores on the streets, they're scary, you don't know what they're liable to do. One of the, the, the finest characteristics of this community is its tolerance. The reason that a lot of those people are here is because uh, people are tolerant of aberrant behavior, people are tolerant of drug use, people are tolerant of prostitution because they understand where a lot of these people are coming from. I spent a lot of time going out and saying, this is a real community, this is a unique community, and a time when people have lost understanding of what, what makes for real community, and to try to, you know, how many times have been trying to carry that message, and it doesn't seem to really get anywhere. I mean, it moves some people at some times. The people, the idea of community is just empty for them. They don't understand it in the depth. But you say, there's a plague, people dying, it's gonna cost everybody money. Somehow it's able to touch people in a way that, uh, that, that generally the other issue is not. The AIDS rate is going up like crazy and that's tied directly into poor housing. So you wanna pay $150,000 per person who gets AIDS minimum just for their health care costs. Uh, to get them to the point where they die. Um, you know, all, the, all of the costs surrounding uh, the break and enters and, and the crime that is associated with the drug industry, which is also linked into poor housing. The available space for poor people to be down here is shrinking. Everything from space being taken up at the new edge thing going in down there that won't be going for poor people to such things as the welfare office at Maine and Powell uh, putting screens over the stairway so poor people can't be on the stairway anymore. I mean, it's just shrinking the space in all kinds of ways it's happening down here. I don't want to see a community of rich people having to dance around poor people to do their business and poor people kind of being left, you know, looking through the frost fencing at what's going on and not being able to afford it, not being able to relate to it. There's only like three or four phones to service all these people around here that are supposed to be looking for jobs. They need a place with a lot of phones uh, so that people can communicate. They should build buildings for the poor. The Canadian Army, you know, instead of them like doing nothing or going to Somalia to kill some people. We gotta make our own cabin, I guess. Mm -hmm. Gotta go way up in the moon dots, <laughs> way up north. If it was any other area of Vancouver that was having as many overdose deaths and that this epidemic had turned into a plague, there would be, they, would, they would not shrink at the resources to pour in to deal with it. And it's happening especially to Latino and First Nations people and increasingly to women. And so these are people that, you know, fuck them, let them die down there. They don't need housing, they don't need anything. Kick them in the ass and drive them out of there or throw them in jail for a few hours or do something, but we aren't gonna give them any money, real money, to address this. But if it was happening in some of these other neighborhoods, there was an outbreak at UBC or something, I mean, it'd be a whole other story. They would do, if they had to marshal the resources of the, uh, of the entire health budget to address it, they probably would. They would do whatever it took to stop this because the, the outcry would be uh, enormous.
for these, my own, myself, my tortured prey and degraded predators, my sisters and brothers. Let my words sing a prayer, not a curse, to the tragic and sacred mystery of our beautiful, suffering, eternal worth. I mean, the ironic thing to me is when I came out, I saw there were police on horseback here in the summer patrolling the 100 block, and I thought, the horses are shitting on the sidewalk and leaving a lay there, and on the 100 block, that's all you need with people staggering, slipping, and sliding through these giant horse turds there, and they're walking in front of the doorways of the Balmoral and elsewhere, and there's, there's people who are impaired, there are people who are disabled, and I thought, this is a dangerous situation here with these horses. So uh, I went into this loud harangue when the police were at, at the Carnegie Center about, just get rid of these horses. Well, I don't know. I don't accomplish many things in this, but uh, he said, okay, we'll get rid of the horses. And then a cop came up to me after the meeting and said, geez, you know, the horses, that's the one thing people like down here. They like the horses. And I thought, well, there it is. My accomplishment uh, in all this political action has been to get rid of the one thing people down here like. <laughs>